We do have SummerSlam news, although it has nothing to do with this year's SummerSlam. WWE this week announced, in partnership with the Minnesota Sports and Events Group, that Minneapolis is going to host SummerSlam over two nights on Saturday, August 1st and Sunday, August 2nd, 2026 at U.S. Bank Stadium. The announcement says that the 2026 edition of SummerSlam will be the first premium live event in Minneapolis since TLC Tables, Ladders, and Chairs in 2019 and will mark the first time the WWE will host a stadium event in the city. In addition to the massive two-night event, WWE and the uh, Minnesota group will deliver a host of fan and community events in the days leading up to and after SummerSlam. TLC 2019, I believe that was the show where uh, Baron Corbin, King Corbin, pinned Roman Reigns, which up until WrestleMania this year was the last time that Roman Reigns ate a pinfall. I believe it was on that show. We have not even gotten to this year's SummerSlam yet, and we already know the date and location of SummerSlam two years from now. Now, why are they announcing this so early? I think it's because Minnesota is licking its wounds after thinking that they were going to get WrestleMania next year. And then they found out, oops, change of plans. And they found out they were not getting WrestleMania. And they had egg on their face. And so this is a way to placate them and show them it's a show of good faith. That we're not just telling you we're going to go ahead and announce it right now so we're locked in. And it may not be WrestleMania, but you can still count on getting a nice economic boost from the two nights. It's like I said, I, I think I said it on TNT recently. Minneapolis was not getting WrestleMania in 2026. They were going to get another big show like the Royal Rumble or SummerSlam. The minute their travel and tourism person in, in the announcement that uh, they put out a few weeks ago, the minute that they lost out on the show in 2025, and they said that they look forward to bringing another WWE event to the city. Event, he said, not WrestleMania. That's when I knew Mania was not going there. Their Mania dreams were dead. And they knew that WrestleMania was not coming to Minneapolis. Now, even if this is just a make good for Minneapolis, which it is, it is a make good for them. And that's why they're doing the two nights instead of one. Okay, well, you're not going to get WrestleMania, which is usually two nights. So we'll do a two-night SummerSlam for you. Even if that's the case, do not be surprised to see other events like the Royal Rumble Follow suit, especially with two Rumble matches. They can spread them out over two nights. This is an experiment, is what this is. And if this does well, we are absolutely going to see this become a regular thing. The so-called Big Four could all go to the two-night format eventually. And when I say Big Four, I'm talking Money in the Bank before Survivor Series. Not that it wouldn't eventually happen with Survivor Series as well. They've got two War Games matches. You could do the same thing. But Survivor Series... I hate to break it to you, has not been one of the big four for a very long time. That distinction belongs to Money in the Bank. It's been that way now for a number of years. But this is a test. And if they have no problem filling that stadium for back-to-back -back nights, that would make them a lot more comfortable following suit with those other shows. So you're going to see it. It's just a matter of time. I also don't think that we can discount the possibility that SummerSlam moving to two nights in 2026 could also have something to do with Saudi Arabia having a chance at getting WrestleMania, and they may move the show out of North America that year. Remember what the chairman of their entertainment authority told Ariel Helwani a couple of weeks ago, that they were having active, ongoing discussions with WWE about bringing either the Royal Rumble or WrestleMania over there in 2026 or 2027. So the timeline fits. I don't know that it's a done deal, but that could be why they want to make sure they have at least one major PLE that year that spans two nights uh, stateside that people can attend. So I, I think there's a lot of moving parts here uh, as far as why this is happening. I think there's more than one reason, frankly, why this is happening. They already have registration up for the ticket presale. Uh, it really, you know what it really drives home to me? The fact that they felt comfortable enough to go ahead and make this announcement this soon and the, the registration for the pre-sale is already up, it drives home the fact that now more than ever, the brand itself has become the selling point. I think we've kind of known that for a while, but more than any one individual star, 
any one match that they might be promoting. It's the WWE brand that sells. That's what it is. You know, that's why they can announce something like this so far out and expect that it's going to sell if they just slap their initials on it. It's all about the brand. And that's a, it's, you see something like this and it really drives home that point that it's just not the way it used to be where you had names on the marquee or you would promote that, hey, The Rock is coming back and he's going to be in a big match. And yeah, The Rock will help sell extra tickets and do big business, but it's not about that anymore. It's not about putting Austin or Rock or Cena or Hogan or any of these names up there. It's, hey, WWE is coming to town. WWE is doing a big event. You, you want to make sure that you're a part of it. You don't want to miss out. And then, boom, it sells. I think business-wise, it makes sense. You know, the whole two-night thing with the product being so hot. I'm not surprised that they're doing something like this, even though it is two years from now. You know, are, are they getting greedy? Sure. You know, when business is booming, that's what happens. You get greedy. Will the product still be this hot in 2026? Nobody knows the answer to that. Obviously, TKO is banking on the fact that they will be. Uh, as with the insane prices they charge for tickets for their international shows, it's all about supply and demand. If the demand is there, then they can get away with it. I do think it takes some of the shine off of WrestleMania. When you have all of these other events in big stadiums already, and now if they move to the two-night format as well, I do think that it takes a little bit away from WrestleMania. It just it loses some of that luster. But you could look at it a different way. You could look at it and say, well, this could be their way of trying to you know, test the waters to see if they can bring SummerSlam up to WrestleMania standards. You know, where headlining night one of SummerSlam and night two of SummerSlam could mean just as much as headlining night one of WrestleMania or night two of WrestleMania. You know, that's one of the reasons making King and Queen of the Ring a stepping stone to a main event spot on that show makes all the sense in the world. It's like I've been saying for the longest time, King of the Ring can be to SummerSlam what the Royal Rumble is to WrestleMania. And it could also allow them to throw up the rights to these other shows to the highest bidder. You know, we know that cities bid on the right to host WrestleMania. Now they can start doing the same for SummerSlam and for the Royal Rumble and for Money in the Bank and everything else. So in the next two or three years, we may see every PLE up for grabs to whoever is willing to pay them the most money to host the show. Now, keeping with TKO... They continue to eliminate any redundancy in the front office between WWE and UFC. See, I can use corporate speak, too. Uh, we knew this sort of thing would happen after the merger. I, I just find it odd that we are only hearing about WWE layoffs and no UFC layoffs. I haven't seen anything mentioned about any kind of UFC layoffs as they try to integrate these teams together. TKO has now combined the WWE and UFC live events teams. They issued a press release on Thursday announcing that the newly named live event strategy team will drive revenue growth strategies across key areas, including live event development and scheduling, tourism incentive programs, ticketing, and fan experiences. This new structure aligns with TKO's efforts to leverage the power and expertise of both UFC and WWE to maximize event revenue potential and pursue growth opportunities and cost synergies. I'm so happy that they can pursue cost synergies. Don't you just love those cost synergies? Longtime UFC executive Peter Dropik, and I swear to God, when I first read this, I thought it said Peter Dropkick. What a perfect name that would have been. I'm actually disappointed now that that is not his name. So I may call him that anyway. But he is going to head up the new group, and he will be working with TKO leadership as well as Dana White, Nick Khan, and Paul Levesque. And the release noted that in Q1 alone, WWE set 54 individual market records for both gross and paid tickets across all event types, including 17 consecutive sellouts for televised events. So it's curious then, you know, with that kind of success, why WWE would let go of its EVP for live events. Uh, John Porco was his name, and and do so in the middle of WrestleMania season, no less, but that was the report back in March. This might explain why the move was made, but it's still curious they would let him go when their live events are as hot as they are. I mean, their live events are as hot as they've maybe ever been. It's insane. 
Now, Dropic, from what I can see on his LinkedIn page, the UFC guy, he's been working for them as an EVP of event development and operations since 2006. Porco had been with WWE since 1999, but was only an executive in live events since 2018 or so. So it may have just been a matter of experience, but WWE has far more experience in running live events than UFC does. You know, WWE is a company that in the past has run up to 300 live events every year, including markets I'm sure UFC has never run before. Why are we only hearing about layoffs on one side and not the other? You know, I saw Post Wrestling is now reporting that Beth Fisher, WWE's head of corporate social responsibility, was let go last week after 13 years with the company. Fightful is also reporting that WWE Senior VP of Entertainment Relations, Kristen Prouty, who had worked with the company since 2000, actually, has also been let go. And so we've been getting a lot of these reports, and I'm sure we're probably going to get more. And I know that uh, UFC and Endeavor, they've been you know under Endeavor now for a number of years already. WWE is new to all this. But again, with the live event experience that this company has as compared to UFC, it's a little surprising to me that we seem to only be hearing about this thing on one side. You would expect this sort of thing with these mergers, but it all feels very one-sided right now. 